Guys, sit down. Let's get started. Oh, my goodness. You know what excites a fellow like me? When I say a fellow like me, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> my wife said she likes the beard, too. That's why it's still on. So, uh, <laughs> but, you know, Todd and I, obviously our lives have been changed, and we share it and talk and get invited to do things like this. But I'll tell you what's a payday and what's exciting to me is that you are this excited. Seriously, about being here. So I look out at all your faces, and you're like, ah, and sharing these testimonies, and we just sit back there. Todd was just sitting with me. We're just watching the screen, and we're just excited that you're excited, and that Jesus is having his way in and through our lives. Amen? Amen. So we want to keep that train rolling. We're going to talk about that and just a lot of good things. I'm just glad you're here. I'm glad I got to come and hang out with my buddy and see all of you and it's just fun. So you ready to roll? Because we don't have a ton of time. I think they want me done by about, what time's my time? 4.20? 4.20. 4.20. It's right on my email. 4.20, dude. <laughs> <laughs> like I teach till four and by 20 after they're high. No, <laughs> no, but they did say 420. So that's going to be not too far from now. It'll go fast. We're going to have fun. So, uh, wow. God, you're really good. I, uh, I don't, I don't get to sit. I don't do these with, with, uh, lifestyle that much. So just sitting listening to Todd's heart this morning, Tom's heart last night. He didn't know I was here last night. Tom, he said, oh, you were here? I said, yeah, because see, I'm a Yankee fan, and he said he doesn't talk to people that wear Yankee hats. So that's why I didn't wear a Yankee hat, because I wanted to talk to Tom this weekend. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah, I was here. I heard your bias message. <laughs> but, you know, Todd talked about this morning, he talked so much about the finished work in your past, and we're a new creation and it's done. And I just want to cheer that whole thought on that. I, I can't amen that enough. Guys, it is so imperative that before anything, we're believers in what he said and what he accomplished and that we slow down and turn off enough to, to really hear what he really did. And not yell but, like he said, yell but, well, if our way around it, but really settle down and really get a hold Todd just said something to me right before I got up here. Well, before he said, are you nervous? And then he laughed. But uh, right before that, he said, it's amazing. You can read the Bible your whole life and not see the clear gospel. You got to make sure that you're not reading through what you've been taught. You, you, you got to read to see, not to read because you think you already know. You, you want to you wanna be looking. You want to be always teachable. It's not that you don't know anything. I'm not talking about some, some weird place you're putting yourself in. But, but, but in the beginning, it would be good. When I got saved, the morning after, this is how you found me the morning after, crying on my bed, crying hard. And I said, I don't know you. I don't, I don't know you. I know now you're real, but I don't know you. A lot of people are saying a lot of things about you. And I believe you're in this book. So when I start reading this book, would you please show yourself to me? And that's how I've always read my Bible, to know Him. So I didn't read it with presumption. I didn't read it with pre-notion. I didn't read it through the language that was put in me growing up. I just read it for Him to speak to me so that I could really know Him and see Him. Guys, when He tells you to reckon yourself dead indeed to sin and alive unto God, He means it. He doesn't mean for you to analytically assess and say, yeah, but brother, we always sin and we're never perfect and you know we're not. He doesn't, he's not asking for all that. When he says to reckon yourself dead indeed to sin and alive unto God, he means it. He doesn't want you to talk around it through life's experience. He wants the truth of what he's saying to change that experience. But if you keep and I keep interpreting the word through what's been, we're going to miss what he paid for. When he says in 1 Peter 2 that he bore your sin and my sin in his body on a tree, he means it. <laughs> your sin and my sin in his body on a tree. Why? That we having died to sin. 
Now, I just quoted two different sections of Scripture where the Bible calls you dead to sin and says you're to die to it. That means it's stain, it's desire, it's memory, it's actions, it's pull. Everything about it is what you were never created for. You come out of darkness into the light. The gospel is so powerful to bring change. Not just forgiveness, change. Like, like, like... <laughs> Be honest with me, and I'm not, man, I'm, I'm glad we're going to live forever. But I promise you the goal of the gospel isn't just for you to get your name in a book called Life so that when the trumpet blows, you're on the list. It, it's about you becoming the person he intended from the beginning. It's about all things restored and made new from the power of Satan to the power of God out of darkness into the light. Right? So that your life can be lived effective. So that you can write a legacy. That you can bring glory to his name through the life that you live. It's, it's not about being positioned for heaven someday. It's, it's everything being restored back to the beginning and all things made new again. So it's just, it's a big deal. I'm passionate about it. I'm, I'm trying to stay calm enough to communicate it half the time. It, the gospel's designed to transform your life. Our lives will never be transformed without a fresh perspective. As I listened to Todd this morning, I'm like, man, this thing is so simple. That's so clear. That's so clear. That's so clear. And what I was hearing, and it's what I preach a lot, it's perspective. The, the Lord wants to change the way you see, the way you think, the why behind your life, your reason for being. The thing that motivated you before Jesus your whole life, it was self-centered, self-serving, self-conscious. It was all about you getting by, you surviving, you getting something out of life or out of someone. When you die, you deny yourself. When you die to live, when you get born again, you die to sin, 1 Peter 2, remember I quoted it? You die to sin once for all. Guess what the next verse says? That you might live for righteousness that what did Todd share this morning what's righteousness mean not guilty that you might live to be not guilty and by his stripes you are wow isn't that amazing so the gospel's telling you every day you wake up you wake up to be found in him you wake up because he bore your sin and my sin in his body on a tree. So you wake up dead to sin and alive unto God in Christ Jesus. Like this thing is so simple. I think it frustrates some people because we've lived analytical. We've been tricked into complexity. We've been tricked into a yell but mentality. We've been tricked in an analytical mindset that, and, and by the way, that's not a gift. Analytical is not a gift. I'm sorry. Listen, I know there's a lot of people here, and there's a lot of people here that have said, well, I'm a very analytical person. Stop. That's not a gift. Intellect, high IQ, praise the Lord. Analytical is different than an IQ. Analytical is making simple things complex. God never gave you the ability to talk yourself out of him. That came through the fall of man. It's called earthly wisdom. Ooh, I can feel that's not well received. That's, that's okay. That's okay. Analytical is not a gift. It's, 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 you analyze the thing and you run it through. You know, somebody says, Jesus really loves you. Well, you know, I know he said he loves me because he died on the cross and he did shed his blood, but I mean, I did know better. I shouldn't have done that anyway. I mean, where's my heart even for him? Is my heart even pure? Am I even saved? And next thing you know, you're on this thing of, of thinking that Jesus never put in you. You can tell somebody they're forgiven and they'll talk for five minutes telling you why they might not be. That's what I mean by analytical. Analytical. Well, I'm a very analytical person. Okay, I'm going to say this. Don't get mad at me. Don't leave. Just hear me out. I've never seen a person confessing to be analytical that was walking in true freedom and blessed in the joy of the gospel. Because the analytical, the reason you're talking to me, they say, well, yeah, but I'm analytical. It's because they yell button the truth. A high IQ is amazing. Use it for the glory of God. Intellect is awesome. But the way that seemeth right to a man is not cool. 
How do you know? Because of the fruit that it bears. If what you're thinking doesn't produce life, it can't be from him. He came to give you life and life even more. So if the way you're thinking, attributing it to being okay, if it's not producing life, it can't be him. Watch this. If it's not encouraging your heart, it can't be him. If it's not moving you forward, it can't be him. And I've seen too many good people that have a heart to believe the gospel get stymied and stuck by wrong believing through just analytical process. So I don't know why I camped there for a little bit, but I did. I'm sorry. I, I'm just telling you boldly, it's not a gift. It's not a gift. And I can't tell you how many countless people said to me, well, I'm just very analytical. And I'm like, well, then stop that, like right now. <laughs> analytical would be Jesus carrying the cross, stop at about halfway to Golgotha and saying, Barabbas, are you kidding me? I mean, how much is a guy supposed to take? I mean, I've done nothing but good. They treat me like I'm bad constantly. I heal the sick, and they tell me that I'm a demon-possessed Samaritan. I mean, these people are so against me. How could they possibly be for me? They're certainly not gathering to me. They must be scattering. And now analyticals using Scripture. Yeah? And he says, you know, Barabbas killed a man. I raised the dead. They want to release him and crucify me? you got to be kidding. I know all these scriptures were written beforehand and it needs to happen, but I'm not feeling it right now. These, these people, <laughs> that's analytical. And it's full of yell butts. And we've had this phrase ever since he's known me, we've had this phrase, yell butts are devils. Because they, they get in the way of yes and amen. You can't have a yell butt why you can't shine. You you can't have a yell butt why you can't love your spouse. You can't have a yell butt why you can't live the gospel. A yell butt is a lie. So it just comes right back to believing God. So I'm, you guys are all here. We're excited. And I wish I had something a whole lot deeper for you. But man, if we believe that he believes we were made for his image and believes that it's worth dying so we could come alive in him, that's probably something good to believe. If, if, if we can believe that he's for us and not against us, he'll never leave us, never forsake us, and, and flip that into more of the walking in love mentality instead of receiving everything we think we need to get through life. See, when we say he'll never leave us or forsake us, a lot of times we think he's never going to let anything bad happen to us. We're always going to have enough. And we get in a survival mentality. We get into a God for me mindset instead of a God through me mindset. And there's a big difference because one will push you into survival and it will get you to go to God for what he can do for you. But the true gospel is God making you look more like him through the person of Holy Spirit. Are you with me? Okay. So back to what I was trying to talk about with everything that Todd was sharing this morning about starting where he finished and the, the blood being enough. And uh, he was talking about several ministries and, and you know, I know people get a little uncomfortable. I, I had one years ago, a minister of a ministry tell me, brother, I know you respect the blood and appreciate, but sometimes you, it's, you just need more than the blood. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm like, you just said the wrong thing. Because that's a giveaway. You're trying to do the work of God on your own or something, and your heart might be right in your effort, but man, you're out of bounds. You got to teach people who they are. You don't tell them to knock it off. You teach them who they are. If I can make a tree good, the fruit will change. If I can tell you who you are, inspire you to believe that through scripture and through his sacrifice man god's grace is he's so good he's so faithful if the tree's good fruit's good so it seems like we ought to follow the word and really find out who we are and say yes and amen to the finished work and never look back because there's nothing there like there's nothing there 
That's why it's a gift of repentance. It's a gift of righteousness. You can find scripture that puts the word gift in front of righteousness in Romans 5. You can find the word gift in front of repentance right there. You can find it in Timothy that God might grant repentance. It's a gift. You got to open the package. And once you open the package, put it on and see that it was made for you. That when you put on that gift, you look the best you've ever looked. And you just ain't never taking it off again. Look, if he made you righteous, he made you righteous. You say, yeah, but I failed afterward. Well, then get your eyes all the more back on righteousness. Because that's the only reason we fail. It's because we get off of righteousness. If you start waking up every day living like you're not guilty, guess what your life will start producing? Fruit that's not guilty. Your trees of, who planted the trees? Your trees of righteousness, the planting of the, that he might be, he's talking about through your life. He made you something to produce something that always looks like him. First law in your Bible, seed time and harvest time, eat seed after its own kind. If he can teach us through the cross, you've been made right, your life becomes right. And you never again have to try to do good because you've become something. Are you with me? And you can say all day long, yeah, but brother, none of us are perfect and we're always going to sin and you got to be careful. And you can go on that rat race tangent line that never produced anything that changed a life. And think you're bearing witness a human experience. But when do you ever receive grace? When do you ever receive the supernatural power of God to live beyond what we've known? This topic that I'm touching barely, you can hardly talk about in the body of Christ. Because heresy flags and blasphemy flags start rising up in people's minds. Because I'm not sure we've been following him in this arena. I think we've been following ourselves. And I'm not sure we've been following him and letting grace have its perfect way. What is it possible for a life to look like receiving the measure of grace he paid for? What's a life look like that's immersed in the empowerment of God in simple childlike faith? Do you think that's a failure? Do you think that's perpetual sin? Do you think it's evil, wicked heart? Or do you think it's a new heart? Do you think it's new life, new creation? Probably so, huh? So my encouragement to you, just in opening up today, is this. Take everything that he paid for and, and think about this. Everything that he paid, I mean, and think about what he paid it for. Not just your forgiveness. Not just your name in a book called life. But for you to literally become that thing he intended from the beginning so you could be empowered to follow what he looked like. Christ in who? Christ in who? Christ in you. You see how personal you got to take this? Christ in you, the hope of glory very, very simply means any manifested, made, seen attribute of God. Anything that's seen and realized of who God is, is the glory of God revealed. So the Christ in you, within your sphere of influence, within your job, within your family, within your, just your life, within your sphere of influence, you got it. The Christ in you is the hope of God being seen and known. Now you multiply that by the number of faces I'm looking at. And you tell me if we get this, this isn't an army. Because it's not the pressure of evangelism. It's not you trying to reach out. It's you becoming something. And in becoming something, you carry the attitude of that thing, the expression of that thing. And the fruit of that thing. And all of a sudden you're not trying to evangelize. A transformed life is evangelistic. Love is evangelistic. The brand new you is created to be evangelistic. It's, it's not a step to follow. It's a life that you live. You all good? Okay.
Good. Uh, I want you to see something. Since since Todd was there, he 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 he. He expressed what I feel all the time. He started quoting chapters. People say, what's your favorite verse? And I'm like, I don't have one. I really don't. I'm not a favorite kind of guy. I don't have favorite color. I just love color. I don't have a favorite number. I'm just not a favorite guy. I really don't have favorite stuff. I, I just, I, I, yeah. I mean, if I, think I'm, if I think blue's my favorite, then I'm thinking red looks pretty good at the same time. I'm just confused on that. So. But people say a favorite scripture, and I'm like, oh, man. I think I have one and 10 more bombard me and, and then it's probably, I was just reading John 20 at a church last week and I said, I'll tell you, I could almost say this is like my favorite scripture. I know it's in the top 100. <laughs> but he started quoting Colossians, Philippians, Ephesians, and I'm sitting there going, man, they're so good. Like you could just sit and read one of these chapters over and over, talk to Holy Spirit and ask him to teach you and just keep reading over and over and muse and meditate on it. Like he said, Ephesians 1, over and over. So that thing just gets in you. Amen? Amen. Look at Colossians 1 with me. I want you to see this. There's a reason we teach on this stuff all the time. So you run well and keep running well. It's so you never let those testimonies that we just heard start having a bigger voice in your identity than what he accomplished. That's where pride kicks in. That's where things get weird. Things get weird when people get in the way of grace. If you're doing ministry to feel good about yourself, you're never going to because you're always going to be striving to maintain something. And you're always under pressure and the ministry's defining you. That is way, way out of place. There's a lot of ministers that are hurting because that was what they were doing. And then they believe, they actually believe people let them down. And they believe ministry is so challenging. And when there's self-centeredness involved in your life, life is challenging. I say it everywhere I go. I don't believe politics is the trouble in the world. I don't believe it's ISIS. I don't believe it's the president. I don't believe it's racial conflict. I really don't. All those things are real. They're relevant. I don't think that's the problem on the earth. You can't pinpoint that as the major problem. I feel like the words pinpointed the major problem on the earth. It's every day, every single day, men wake up and live for themselves when they were made for God's image. That's why there's so many attitudes, opinions, so many fights. That's why there's so much back and forth. That's why social media can get really ugly. Because it's just an opinion platform. And the Bible says, don't be wise in your own opinion. In our whole lives, well, this is what I think. Well, you know what I think? Well, this is what I say. It's probably not important if it's not coming from him. Like probably giving your boss a piece of your mind is probably not life-changing. <laughs> your, your wife's at home praying for you to have an amazing spirit-led day, and you finally just let her fly at work, man, and told the boss how you feel. Great job. <laughs> now the world's changed. <laughs> Did you ever do that? You finally vent and you let it loose and you share everything that's been built up and you actually, for a moment, you feel good. You're like, Arr, I mean, you just feel cocky. <laughs> you see how zero that is? You come home from work, you're like strutting. You're praying wife. Hi, honey, was your day good? My day was amazing. Really? Oh. <laughs> Why was it so amazing? She's thinking you like won the whole staff or something to the Lord. Well, you know, I've been pent up for too long and kept my mouth quiet. I finally told the boss what I think and gave him a piece of my mind. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's probably what he needed. <laughs> See, I remember living that way. I'm glad that way's going. Because it says, unless you die, you abide alone. That's a lonely place. It's a lonely place. Unless a seed dies and falls to the ground, it abides alone. Why? Because you were never to live toward yourself. You're supposed to die. So you can spring up. See, somewhere between dying and springing up, Something changes. Your motive, your reason for being. 
You die to everything you've ever been, so when you spring up, you can grow into everything he is in you. There's a real exchange between dying and springing up. Because if you, if you don't die, you abide alone. But if you die and fall to the ground, you spring up and bear much. Now, I'm not the brightest man, but abiding alone and bearing much fruit sound different. <laughs> yeah? And in this, the Father's well pleased that you abide alone. Wow. So this dying thing is a big deal. And it's dying to what? It's yourself. That's not some rigid, legalistic. It's so simple. It's perspective. It's waking up every day realizing, man, I wasn't created to be driven by need. I wasn't created to be right. I was created to be like him. I was created to love, to believe the best, to take no account of a suffer wrong because I don't think for myself. Wow, I was created for his image, his glory. I was created for others and to love and the interest of others and not just my own and to lay down my life and to be a friend. That's called deny yourself, people. It's really simple. What if you lay on your bed every morning when you wake up just teach your heart these things. Every morning you wake up, you look up and say, wow, God, thank you for another day. That sure beats, oh, God, I hope you get me through this day. <laughs> That's typical Christian prayer. Alarm clock, six o'clock. Oh, my goodness, six o'clock already? God, please. <laughs> and then you think about getting up at 3.30 to go to the bathroom, and that disturbed your sleep, and then you took till 4.20, 25 to go to bed. <laughs> and then your mind analytically, rationally assesses that you missed an hour and a half of sleep, so practically you're going to be tired, and oh God, if I don't have your grace, I'll never make it through the day, and then we call that prayer. <laughs> Anybody ever think like that in the morning before? <laughs> or am I talking to no one? <laughs> and if you're not careful, you already run your day through your mind and you pray to work beside this person and not this person and you hope you get this job and not this job. <laughs> and next thing you know, all your faith is wrapped around your day working out the way you hope. Instead of all your faith wrapped around a perspective that causes light to shine out of your life in the face of whatever comes. Because the whole goal is to shine. The whole goal is to shine. The whole goal of a Christian is to shine in the face of whatever comes. That's the whole goal. Honestly, listen, I'm just going to be so narrow with you. If we miss that kind of thing, we miss why Jesus came and shed his blood. He didn't come just to forgive you of your sins. He came to put his life inside of you. His nature, his will, his motives, his heart, his being. That's why he gave us the same spirit to raise him from the dead. Yeah? To make us one. He, my whole life I was taught he died to forgive my sins. I, I understand in his death there's the forgiveness of sins. I get it. I get it. He had to die because of sin. I get all that. But oh my goodness, it's so much more intimate and powerful he died to transform me, to give me new life, to put who he is inside of me so I could look through his eyes, live from his heart, so I could follow him, so that I could be the body of Christ. Yeah, so that I could forgive and people would know the way to forgiveness, so that I could love and show mercy and make peace and be a Christian. Not hurt and offended and hold on to my rights and I'm a Christian and now I have even more rights. <laughs> Forgive me, I've pastored for a little while. I've been in a lot of counseling sessions. It's always fascinating me how Christians have so many rights when they've denied themselves. <laughs> Can I help us with something? You got one right to be like him. That's what he paid for. He paid to put who he is 
inside of us. That's what he paid for. That's why he did it. That's why he hung there. That's why love wouldn't change its mind. He looked to the joy set before him and he saw you and me restored. You know what's amazing about Jesus? He did it knowing some people wouldn't receive that. He did it knowing some people would fight that. He did it because it's truth. And love made it possible for you and me to be changed. So don't fight it. Don't, don't fight it. Let simple faith wrap around your heart and be like a child. And say, man, my days of animosity, offense, discouragement, frustration are coming to an end. It's, it's got to end now because there are all evidences of self-centered things. I say this stuff everywhere I go. None of this is new stuff to me. It just needs shouted over and over till it just becomes who we are and becomes our life. Where we stop buying into any other mindset. The yell butts get totally wiped out of our lives, right? But you be honest with me. If you're discouraged, if you're truly discouraged, where's your focus? There's no way you can tell me you're seeking first the kingdom of God if you're discouraged. People are usually discouraged because of how things are working out or aren't working out, what it's costing them, putting them through, and when is this going to change, but now I'm not going to be able to, well, how come? And if you listen to the language, it's all about you. That would be Jesus sitting on a rock at night when his disciples are sleeping, crying, saying, I don't think they like me. You know, I've been trying and trying, I mean... I mean, I preach the truth. You tell me to preach truth. I have to preach truth, but I do love them and I care. I mean, how many of their sick have I healed already? And, but I don't think they like me, Lord. I don't know if I want to go back out there in the streets again tomorrow. They just don't seem the friendliest. I mean, you're the one that lets me hear all their thoughts. I wish you wouldn't even let me hear their thoughts. Because <laughs> their thoughts aren't really that edifying. Wouldn't it be amazing to be so secure that God could let you hear the thoughts of men? Did you ever think about it? That Jesus could hear their thoughts because he could? Because it wouldn't change him? Some of you say, oh, I just want to hear your voice. You might be amazed. <laughs> that in God's great love for you, he can't let you hear everything. <laughs> He can't show you everything he'd like to show you. There was a long time ago he was showing me some things. And I asked him, he said, do you know why? And I said, so I can pray. He said, I'm showing you because I can. And I went, Ooh. I started crying because I knew what he meant. And this is what he said to me laying on my bed. He said, I can tell myself anything. You become one with me and you're in. Wouldn't it be amazing if he whispers something to you and it wouldn't break your heart for you, but it would break your heart for them. And you would actually pray from the right place and heaven would hear and grace would pour into that situation. Rather than break your heart for you and then you need healed and repaired and fixed and now your trust is broken and it takes you two years to let somebody even get close again. It's not the gospel. It's human psychology and it's Adam, not Jesus. Jesus didn't have walls. You just be careful with that stuff, okay? Why are you talking like this at a power and love? Because if these things aren't relevant in your life, you can go out there and pray for the sick all you want, but what about freedom? What about freedom? I wonder if praying for the sick starts trying to take the place of true freedom. I wonder if a word of knowledge starts taking the place of true freedom. Now you're doing what Todd said this morning and now you're starting a ministry because God's moving through you so much. You don't want that. You want to lay your head on the bed at night and know you're free. That nobody owes you a thing and nobody failed your heart because you didn't have expectations wrapped around people. That you woke up for one reason, to be like him, and you're going to bed that way. 
and nobody owes you a thing and you owe no man anything but to love. And all of a sudden you sigh in that quiet place and know that you're in the best place of your life. The strongest, most freest, most amazing place of your life. And you get up in the morning and look in the mirror and you actually know you're okay. It's just a good place to be, guys. And we can all be there right now, literally right now, by believing. That's why we're all alive, to be like him. Are you with me? Okay. The reason I turned you to Colossians, I want, to sh- I want you to see something. You guys good? Okay. Just, uh, I feel a little stuck right where I've been at here. That's why I'm just standing here. It's rare I stand this still and talk this straight, like. Yeah, it just, uh, my beard feels good too. Uh, <laughs> I'm teasing two friends of mine that might watch this because they don't like my beard. So. <laughs> I was just at a church, so every time somebody says something nice, I jab them a little. I said, you know what this guy just said? Yeah, it's probably about your beard. <laughs> I said, yeah, he walked up to me so sincere, and he said, dude, I watched you on YouTube for years. But that beard just puts it over the top. <laughs> so, so I just knew he thought that and he was sincere. So I ran and told my friend. <laughs> One guy came up and stroked my cheek and said, dude, that looks like double wisdom. <laughs> they, people say funny things. The next guy said, you look like you belong on a picture on a yacht. And I don't know even what that means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, Jesus, help us. Can you tell when we teach that we're passionate about this stuff? That Do you guys get this? Do you understand this? I know I'm speaking for Todd right now. I have no need to stand here in front of you other than I believe what I'm preaching and it's for you. It's for me. It's like some of you, I may never even see you again. I don't know. But you, you just might have a tomorrow, huh? And you might go home to a sphere of influence and you might wake up and believe these things and it might make an amazing difference and people around you might start seeing Jesus like never before. And I think that means something to all of us. <laughs> yeah? Like, it's not about preaching good. If it was about preaching good, we'd probably try to preach better. Whatever that means, right? We'd be thinking about that. Like, I never debrief. I never think about how I look, how I sounded, the analogies I used. I just get up here. It's a blur to me anyway. It's probably like that for Todd. People say, oh, man, I watched this YouTube, this one title. I said, don't, I don't even know titles. I don't even know what YouTube you're talking about. I don't. I get up here and here in this room, this is bright, and I can't even hardly see anybody. So, you know, I don't even, I I know you're out there, but honestly, I can't even see a a face right now. It's like, so that won't bother me anyway, but, but I can't, usually, usually you can see people's faces, you know, and uh, I'm not here to perplex you, make you mad. Like Todd said, some of you look angry. I don't know how you saw him this morning, buddy. I can't see anybody. But I've been in services like that where I was in one a while back. There are glasses, the men's glasses. It wasn't my imagination. They were all sitting down on their noses. And they were all looking at me like this. Because they've been in church their whole life. And their pastor stood up and said, we're breaking our 80-year tradition of believing God doesn't heal. That's what he said, and that automatically dropped the glasses, and then he said, I'm going to bring in this fella to just preach to us, so I was the fella. (laughs) And you know what I talked about for 20 minutes? How they didn't know Jesus, or they wouldn't be feeling what they're feeling towards me right now. I didn't even talk about healing. I said, you come to church religiously, you don't believe that book. There's no love in this room right now, I can tell. I said, you guys are seeing me as an enemy, and if I was really that wrong, you should cry for me and hope that I don't get lost. You shouldn't be mad at me and blogging stuff and posting stuff that's hateful. 
You just prove you don't know Jesus when you do that. That's what you do. When you say you're a Christian and you're bashing other people, you prove you don't know Jesus. You're religious. Because Jesus isn't bashing people. He's laying down his life for people. He's laying down his life for people he doesn't agree with. Yeah. <laughs> it is a good word. So be careful with getting caught up in that stuff in nowadays, okay? It's just too easy. There's too easy for people to go out there and voice their opinion. Don't make sure you stay loving. If you, if you believe somebody's wrong and really believe they're wrong, you probably ought to weep for them before you talk about them. Yeah, you probably ought to weep for them. You probably ought to find the capacity in God to where sin abounds, let grace abound even more. And don't hide religiously. And say, well, I'm just God's watchman on the wall. Be careful. I don't think he appointed you on any wall. Because <laughs> here's how I know that's true, and I'm not overstating anything and judging anyone. Because when, when you do pray from that motive, that wrong motive, heaven doesn't respond anyway. Heaven responds to love. God doesn't change your spouse because you're hurt by your spouse and you cried and prayed in your home group. God changes your spouse because you cried for them because you know they're more than what they're living. And you refuse to take them personal and wake up and be needs driven. And you pray for your spouse because their life and destiny is so much greater. And you see that they're blind and they're handcuffed and they're willful and they're whatever they are. And that makes you cry for them, not because of them. I promise you, that's the prayer heaven hears. And that's when grace goes into your spouse and does a work that brings change. Not because you put your spouse on every prayer chain, because if your spouse doesn't change soon, you don't know what you're going to do. That's not how you'll see your spouse change. That's why it's been 5, 8, 10, 12, or you stop counting years. God responds to love. That's what he responds to. So when you walk out of these doors and start realizing that everybody is on purpose, there's a time to be born. And there ain't an accident on the planet. And you start walking out of these doors from a comfort like this and start realizing that everybody matters, carries the same price tag, and truly does have equal value. And that his blood is speaking better things over every life. And if people are living out of conduct, it's because forgive them, Father. They know not what they... But we do know. That's what we say. So we shouldn't let their not knowing de determine what we do know. We should let what we do know trump all that. And love them beyond that. You making sense of this? Come on, it's simple. That's simple. Okay, I want to accomplish something here, hopefully. I want you to see this in Colossians 1. There's a lot you could look at at Colossians 1. Uh, I wasn't even going to read this, but... <laughs> mm. This prayer sounds a lot like the one in Ephesians 1. And Paul sees the believers, he sees the saints, he sees how they're living. Let me just read it for you. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in, the, in Christ who are in Colossae. Grace to you, peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Watch. Since we heard of your faith... It's amazing that Paul, two places, Ephesians, Colossians, he says, man, ever since we heard of the faith you're walking in, we haven't stopped praying for you. I grew up with a mentality that when you saw people not having faith, they're the ones you're supposed to pray for. Like, he's saying, once I see how saved you guys are, and you're living by faith, I haven't stopped praying for you. See, it's all about influence. It's all about praying for people to become something. You know the idea we've sold ourselves over the years? That we're supposed to pray and believe for somebody till they pray the sinner's prayer. When they pray the sinner's prayer, boom, we got them, they're in. Let's pray for somebody else to pray the sinner's prayer. 
So next thing you know, we got millions of people that prayed the sinner's prayer and haven't even thought about transformation, walking in love and being Christ-like. So we make the whole goal going to heaven instead of the heaven on the earth. So we're all waiting for that day when it's already here. Now is the day. Now is the time. Go preach saying, the kingdom of God is here. Where is it? It's in you. So you didn't pray a prayer to go to heaven. Heaven came back into you. That's not a play on words. That's two dramatically different doctrines. Look, look, I, I, I'm not against the sinner's prayer. It's a tool to get people to understand that they sin, forgiven of their sins. But man, let's teach the gospel. Let's teach people they're being changed. Let's take that jug of water, man, and pour it over that dude. Marquise, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. It's all about change. We, we, don't pre we preach salvation well in the sense of making sure you go to heaven. And I understand there's a hell. Some people say, you know, you know, I don't think Dan believes in hell. I don't use hell as a motivation. I want to use God's goodness and God's love as a motivation. Because if you see his first love, you love him. You will love him. Yeah? And if you love him, you'll obey him. <laughs> He doesn't say, if you love me, you obey me. He's saying, if you love me, you'll do what I say to do. He's not saying it as a test. He's making a statement that my love transforms you. And when you see the beauty and glory of who I am towards you, you'll take that into your own heart and be that towards others. And if you love me, you'll obey me. Yeah? Yeah? So if you never see God's first love, you'll just feel indebted to him and you'll serve him and do things in his name. That's the concubine Todd was talking about. And at a service or an altar call or a special moment, you'll get touched by the king. That's the same as a concubine getting called into his chamber, spending time with him. Oh my goodness, I was just with the king. <laughs> Some of them kings in the Old Testament had 700 concubines. It might have been a while till you were with the king again. Especially if you weren't on his top 10 list. <laughs> I'm just saying. Oh, man. So watch this. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, watch this. And your love for all the saints. You just love each other. Yay. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven... So there's a part, that's a part of the gospel. But don't miss this. Your faith and your love for all the saints. Your hope which is stored up in heaven, which you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which has come to you. In other words, here's what, here's what God did. This is why we, we call it going to heaven. Let's just phrase it this way, and, and it might help us understand. We're just never going to die. We're going to live forever because we're one with the eternal one. So Adam was never created to die. He was created to live. The day you eat the tree is the day you surely... So Adam was created to never die. He was created to live, not die. The day you eat the tree is the day you surely die. So death came into the picture through disobedience and separation. The last Adam comes and takes all that away and brings us back to the Father and we live forever so we're back to square one, never going to die. That's why we live forever. But we've made that the emphasis and the motivation of our born again experience. And the evidence of your born again experience should be born again. Not pray a prayer to go to heaven. It should be born again. Like every man was born into Adam. That's why his little two-year-old's a little feisty right now. He's going to need Jesus when he comes of age. As precious as he is, as valuable as he is, so worth adoption, right? Precious future destiny in God, but there's something that needs to change. Mothers come, my child's throwing a fit. My little baby made faces at me. Are they possessed? No, they're going to need Jesus someday. 
Seriously, I pastored, man. Sweet little mothers come. Like, they're just Jesus girls, right? They're just, they don't even raise their voice. Now, honey. And their little baby's like, eh. Ah. <laughs> they come to you and they cry and they ask if they're failing. Why am I failing as a mother? I've never even raised my voice to my child. And my child made an ugly face at me. They're true stories. I'm not exaggerating this. And I'm like, honey, you're probably the sweetest mama. You're probably the kindest mother there. But then why? How? Where does she? She got that from Adam. She didn't get that from you. Remember how he said you sit the truck on the floor? Two little ones sit the truck on the floor? You can have two parents. It's possible. You have two parents that don't fight. Possible. (laughs) It's happened in my home. For 23 years. Yeah. Takes two to tango. Two to tango. Takes one to pursue peace. As long as I'm alive and as long as Jesus is in me, I'm not going to tango and I don't mean dance. Takes two. Takes one to make peace. Blessed are the ones that tango. (laughs) Blessed are the ones that stand for their rights. Blessed are the ones that get it so right and convince their two friends to support them and say they're right. Blessed are the peacemakers. Guess who they are? Sons of God. So this thing, I'm a son, I'm a son, it's not a confession. It's not a new language in the body of Christ. It's an expression. It's a way of life. Sonship is not a confession. It's an expression. Blessed are the peacemakers, for these are the sons of God. So when you make peace, you reveal that you're a son. Not when you confess you're a son. When the confession of sonship produces peacemaking in your life. Watch this. You say love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you. Love your enemy. And pray for those who persecute you. And give to those who would spitefully use you. Why in the world would I do that? So that you may be sons of your father in heaven. Who causes the rain and the sun to come upon the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what do you have any different than the tax collectors and the pagans do as much? Yeah? So we get born again. The Bible says we were all born into Adam. And you must be born again. Of course, everlasting life is in that mix of blessing and bag of blessings and were kept by the power of God for life eternal. It was in the gospel they preached. It's part of the gospel. I'll say it this way and hope you understand. In June 9th of 95, I got born again at work. There was nothing about my born again experience that night that was inspired by the Lord that had to do with going to heaven. I did not become a Christian to go to heaven someday. I became a Christian to die to what I was living so I could become what he always wanted. The reason I became a Christian was to die to live, to put off, to put on. I'm telling you, there wasn't one thing about going to heaven that inspired me to be a Christian that night. I looked into my own heart and by the grace of God saw me for who I was and knew that I never wanted to live another day that way because it was a zero. And I looked up and cried and said, if you're real, because I didn't know, if you're real, can love me and forgive me and have a plan for my life, I'll live for you. And I didn't even know what I was saying, but I knew I was serious. And he came. And he made me see that he was real. And I've never been quite the same since then. But I still didn't know him. So I ran home. I had to root through a bunch of drawers, but I found a Bible. It's not a joke. I had to look for one, but I found one. And I laid and I hugged it and I cried and I talked to him. 
he began to reveal himself to me. This is what I didn't know. That the more I would find who he was, the more I would find myself in him. And the more I got to see who he was, I saw who I was in him. It was the most amazing thing. I started to realize that he made me for his image. He made me to be one with him. He made me to shine like him, to love like him, to make peace like him. And I started to think, wait a minute. We've been talking the total opposite my whole life going to church. We're just evil, wretched, wicked, never know about the human heart. You know, one day we're here, one day we're there. It's a wonder God considers us. Thank God for the blood. (laughs) Anybody grow up with language like that? Why? Because we're following ourselves still. We're not following him now. We're still following ourselves, wondering why he loves us, because we value ourselves based on our past experiences, and it's not too valuable. So then we say, I wonder why he loves us. He loves you for what he created you to be, what he called you to be, what he paid for you to be. He loves what he looks like when he's in you and you're surrendered, and he thinks that's worth a high price. Yeah? So we probably ought to just say, okay. Come on, it's not, I'm not going to be any more complicated. He loves me. How do you know? Because Jesus died on the cross. It's not because I always feel it. It's not because my circumstances reveal it. It's not because anybody in my life showed it to me. It's because Jesus died on a cross when I was a sinner. And what he was saying was, Hey, Dan, I know you, boy, from the beginning. You're a whole lot more than you understand, but I'm the truth, and I know the truth about you, and you're worth this, and I'm glad I took these blows. One day, you're coming free. Grace is pursuing you, boy. I've known you from the beginning. Yeah? That's what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, hey, Dan, I hope you're happy. Look what your sin's done to me. Ain't it time to change your ways, pal? Because if he says that to me, I have no ability to change. But if Jesus, if Jesus tells me that I can be more, not a pastor, not a preacher, not a psychologist, if Jesus is telling me I can be more, that I can follow him, that he can put his life in me, there's one thing I need from you, boy. Deny yourself. Die to everything you've been so everything I am can come alive in you. Now, now he can't have a little of both. He can't have some in and some out. He can't. No, no, no. Die to everything you've been. So who I am can live in you. Yeah. It's not just bring him into your life. It's not let Jesus into your heart. Give him your life. The one you were living, zero. Self-conscious, self-centered, self-defending, self-protecting. How is that working? Not good for any of us. Alone. Time to die to live. Yeah? And then do what my buddy Todd said this morning. It wasn't good advice. It's the word of God. Don't ever look back. I say it all the time. It just sounds cool. You know, you're not Lot's wife. You're his bride. Don't look back. But you know what I mean? You don't look back. It says in parentheses, in the Gospels, Jesus talking, remember Lot's wife, parentheses. She got delivered from Sodom, was heading somewhere. They were told not to look back. She looked back and froze right there between where she came from and where she was going. Never made it. So once you're forgiven of everything you've ever done, there is nothing back there. I know technically we say, well, you know, I used to do this, and hey, I did this, and hey, but spiritually, positionally, technically, that person's dead. Yeah. Like, like, like the reason righteousness is so amazing, it's a gift. He sees you as if you've never sinned. So you and I can't change where we've been. We can't change what we've done. We can't change that storybook. Those pages are written, right? But guess what changes? You change. And when you change, it nullifies the book. Because if you could go back and do something over again and you would do different, you're not the person that did it. You'll never be judged for where you've been. You'll be judged for who you've become. You get it? But if you keep thinking that's you, the tree 
never changes. The identity never shifts. And you keep believing that's you. And you wonder why the same fruit and the same fruit and the same fruit. Think, well, I got to read more. I got to pray more. I got to try harder. No, no, no. You got to believe different. You got to stop believing your failure waiting to happen. Stop believing you're barely forgivable, barely lovely. You're worth it to him. You got to wake up in the morning and not try to be good today. You wake up and just take a minute and enjoy being his. You watch what that'll do for your life. You just get up and enjoy being his. You just stand it in your bathroom. And you got the door closed and nobody knows you're there but you, your conscience, and him. And if the devil knows, let him torment himself. He is not a bother or a threat to you. You say, you wouldn't care if he was in the bathroom? I could care less if he was in the bathroom. Stand there if you want to. You ain't going to do nothing but stand there. You have no place in me. If you want to just see my communion with Jesus. If you want to walk in on my intimacy. <laughs> yeah. Stand there if you want. You ought to start treating him that way. Instead of like he's so powerful in your life. He's powerful when you don't know who you are. He's powerful when you give him landing strips, when you compromise, when you violate your conscience and don't deal with your heart. Then you give him power. He roams around and seeks who he may devour. Wonder if he comes in and observes you and says, can't touch that. The ruler of this world cometh and has, who said that? And did he tell us to follow him? So if Jesus said that, is there a way for me to live and that be true? Is there? A lot of Christians don't believe that. A lot of pastors will tell you that's not fully true. But what's following him mean? What's the things I do, you'll do if you, buh? So it's very critical that you believe. When you say, I don't believe that's quite true, that means you don't believe. You'll never walk in the grace that empowers that truth. Everybody I'm looking at, I get up here, I can see you a little better. That light's really bright. But I get under here, I can see your faces a little. Everybody I'm looking at, he shed his blood for. And he sees you through the blood that speaks better things. He's not marking you for where you've been. He's marking you for where he's been. And he's seeing you through the blood of his son. You see what I'm saying? It's amazing. It's, it's, it's the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness. And it says, if you receive those things, you'll reign as a king in this life. Now, I'm not talking about a king where everybody's serving you, but a king where you're walking in authority, where there's a rulership in your life of the things around you, where stuff isn't owning you anymore, where you're not doing what Todd said this morning, just worrying yourself sick, like Christians that worry all the time. It's a self-centered focus. It's all deception. These things are giveaways, man. When you're just living in worry, anxiety, fear, it means you're not walking in a revelation of God's love that comes simply through the cross. It doesn't come, oh, watch, sorry, forgive me. This is a thing that just oh, it grates on me because people get tricked by it. It's not, not something you're trying to find at an order. It's something you find through truth. There is not one scripture that says ministry shall make you free. We have become a ministry crazed people. We believe we need prayer for everything, hands laid on us, impartation, order call after order call after order call. And it's just not true. You need to believe what's been done, what's accomplished. You need to look to the truth, continue in the word. You'll know the truth. You'll know the truth. Like, like, like the day you camp there and don't move and say, I'm done with feelings and things that are counterproductive. I'm throwing yell butts back to hell where they belong. This is the truth. And you're sitting on your bed reading about, you have to love me or you'd have never died. Wow, you value me. Thanks for forgiving me. Thanks for seeing me precious in your sight. You just start believing and all of a sudden this knowing comes into you. Well, you don't even have to try to believe it. You know it. You see it. Christ crucified. Yeah? yeah. Ugh, it's truth. 
You get alone, you're in your bathroom. Wow, you just love me. Thanks for loving me. Jesus, what you did is phenomenal that you would come as a man and take my place and put everything that I was in you and on you so that I could be everything you are and everything that's in you and on you on me. Oh my goodness, Jesus, you're amazing. You were made to be sin so I could be never again guilty in the sight of God. Father, thanks for loving me. Countless Christians have never done that when nobody's looking. They've been pursuing to feel that instead of believe that. I know. I ask questions. I counsel, man. I, just, I ask what your personal communion list looks like. Most people have a prayer list. They have a needs list. I found lots and lots of Christians don't commune with God and talk to him and be friendly. I'm just saying. Look, there's none of you sitting right here I'm looking at in the front row. If we were driving in a car together for 50 miles, would we talk? Would we get to know each other? So if, if you and me, man, would have to carpool for one straight week, carpool together five days a week and drive three hours in the car every day for five days, 15 hours in the car. And at the end of them five days, if I heard your name mentioned, wouldn't I be able to intimately, affectionately say, oh man, I'm getting to know him. Yeah, I know him. Would we drive together five days a week, three hours a day and not talk to each other? Why do we do it with the Lord all the time? We'll get in a car and listen to teaching about him for three hours. We'll listen to songs singing about him for three hours. And let that take the place of knowing him. Instead of be driving and you hear that song and that thing's touching you, that's why you play it all the time and call it your favorite song. But all of a sudden that thing's playing and all of a sudden you're driving. Now keep your eyes on the road. But you're driving and you're like, Lord Jesus, that's exactly how you see me. Thanks for loving me that way. Oh my goodness, that's amazing. You might even bump the sound down a little. Father, thank you for being who you are. Thank you for putting those ways inside of me. Thank you, God, I'm lacking no good thing. Yeah? That sure beats just playing the song to feel a little more peppy. How many people listen to countless sermons and never spend one solid minute of heart time this way? So you did yourself an injustice because you got a ton of knowledge, but you didn't back it up to where it could become revelation through relationship. And after a while, you know so much. And why hasn't my life changed? And now you have more questions than you have understanding. I've seen this in a lot of good people, people that mean well and are trying hard. But that might be the problem, huh? Amen. I had three ladies at a conference like this, bless their hearts, come up to me one day. They had pens and pads. They said, Pastor Dan, we're so glad to meet you. We listen to you all the time. We watch you all the time. Listen, we want to know what your day looks like in the Lord. Like when you wake up, like how much time in prayer, what's prostrate, how much time is like on your knees. And they were going to write my Christian calisthenic program. <laughs> like I thought, man, should I make a video? This is... You know, <laughs> my Christian aerobic video, how to know the Lord more. I bet you the thing would sell. <sighs> Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. That is really bad. See, see, get thee behind me, Todd. <laughs> I was just going to say. <laughs> I was just going to say, look, the last thing you need is to try to do what Todd does or do what Dan does or do. No, you want to see what we're seeing if we have a revelation. The whole goal of us teaching isn't to say all oh, this and I did this and God did this through me and my life this. Just, no, it's, I don't even talk about how I live by faith. I don't even talk about the way I live every day in faith and the way I function. I don't even talk about it. You know why? Because it's very fruitful, for one. And people would do what I'm doing instead of purpose to see what I'm seeing that empowers me to do it. And they'd turn it into a theology instead of the beauty of a relationship. That's why you don't hear me talk about stuff like that. I'm real personal about a lot of things. I share a lot of stories. But I don't talk about stuff. I don't talk about how I walk through things personally. I know why.
Because way back I realized if I did, people would say, oh, wow, that worked for him. People write books. How God Healed Me of Cancer. They have cancer. They're in a desperate place, so they're reading all those books. And it's a dead giveaway. Now's not the time to read somebody else's book on how they got healed of cancer. Now's the time to pull alone with Jesus and say, you know what? I don't even know what to do right now. I feel like I got caught off guard and I'm trying to build a house in a storm. But you know what? You have to love me. You never sent your son. You value me and you paid a price and I'm thanking you for loving me. And you just start right there with growing in God's love. And you watch what that does for your life. Yeah? Yeah? Knowing his love changes everything. Not preaching his love. No, there's a big difference between me saying, hey, God loves you, and you all going, yay. There's a big difference between that and you being loved by God. Relationally, we take the, we take the preaching, God loves you, and we get alone with him. And all of a sudden, in that place, we're being loved by God by believing the truth. Not because a man that has a revelation of love just laid his hands on your forehead and you felt the Lord. I'm not making light of that. It, it's, it's actually a beautiful thing. But it doesn't take the place of relationship, guys. And if God touches you that way to spring you into this, that's one thing. But if that starts taking the place and now you need that to keep going. I was in the Midwest and a lady came up to me at an altar. Service was over and she said... Sir, I need you to lay hands on me because I need a revelation of God's love. And I said, it's in the cross, honey. You heard everything I preached. It's Jesus. Come on, don't, don't even go there. No, sir, you're walking in it. I see it in your life. You exude it. It comes out of you. And then she named like four or five ministers that everyone would know. They laid hands on me. They laid hands on me. They laid hands on me. And they laid hands on me. And I have had zero experience of God's love when they prayed for me and I have never been able to receive God's love you have it I need you to pray for me I said nope see I wonder if you're bold enough to say no I said nope you're not putting me on their list you're not adding my name I said you're on a wrong pursuit I said, you take the revelation her today. It's in the cross, honey. She got so upset at me. Oh, it made me cry. I said, honey, don't go there. Stop. You're telling me that you won't lay hands on me and impart to me. And this. And I said, I can't give you my relationship. And I said, you're not bound to me touching you and you going, oh, he really does love me. And then it's like, presto, everything's going to be great. I said, no, no, no. Honey, because we, we have this thing, we say one touch. I know we say this. I'm not minimizing the power of God, but what I am coming against is not living by truth. We get mystical. We think, oh, just one touch and everything's changed. No, believe different and everything changes. I've seen people sure they were free and not long after they weren't free. And then I've seen them get free again and not long after they didn't think they were free. And then they get free again. And now they have this whole testimony of free, not free, free, not free. If you don't change the way you believe and what you believe, your life will never truly change. Like, I don't have to believe he loves me anymore. I know he does. I've been with him. He loves me. Right now, I have no evidence or feeling of God's love for me right now on my body. It's not tangible. If I was talking about righteousness, it happens as soon as I go there because I'm going there in a second. You know what he's going to do? He does it every time. To this day, he'll slip up behind me. It feels like somebody wraps their arm around me and hugs me from behind. When I preach on it, it happens all the time. I rarely talk about it, but I, I just, that's an experience I have. Do I have to have that to believe in righteousness? I believed in righteousness way before that came. That came afterward. It was kind of like a kiss on the cheek. Yay. See, see, he's doing it to me right now. I'm just telling you, you don't have to believe me because it's, it's for me anyway. <laughs> you say, well, I don't believe you. <laughs> okay, I'm not losing anything, I promise. <laughs> I'm not losing a thing by your unbelief. I, I promise. <laughs> you didn't draw his arms back. <laughs> In fact, it's getting a little touchy right now. We, we, we got to back off of this topic. <laughs> 
This is bedroom stuff. This isn't platform stuff, Lord. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> he doesn't usually mess with me this way. <laughs> There's things reserved for intimacy, you know. No, stop. Stop. <laughs> you don't understand or you wouldn't be shouting that. Stop. <laughs> No, I know you meant well, but, but more is not what we need right now. We need to communicate. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm in trouble. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> no, 420. <laughs> Seriously, my schedule says 420. <laughs> That's that little thing he's just having fun with me and loving on me like that. I didn't come to believe because he did that. He started doing that as I came to believe. I see people going after that manifestation. But the manifestation doesn't change their everyday belief. They start leaning on the manifestation. So if they're not feeling that way, they don't believe. And then they wonder where God is. Why are we so distant? Has he left? Did I do something wrong? Listen, I could wake up in the morning and he feel like he's a million miles away. He could. He could just feel like he's gone. I remember waking up already and it's like he's not even in the room. But guess where he is? He's in me. So when you wake up and you... You, you, you don't even go like, oh, you're not like, am I not saved? That would be so weird. But people live that way. They're so driven by their feelings and experiences. No, you wake up and you just enjoy being his and you wake up and you know he's already in you and he loves you and he's with you. You're not gauging your experiential status this morning. You just already are settled in belief and that starts deciding your experience. Does that make sense? The one is super healthy and ordained by God. The other one is way backwards. The one is man's attempt to get a hold of God, and that's religion. The other one is God getting a hold of man and settling it. And that's Christianity. Okay. I hope we're establishing something here. Because this is power and love. You guys in, in a minute are going to go out again and have some supper and stuff. Here's what you simply need to know about that. That everybody out there is worth the blood of Jesus. You go into Walmart, you got price checks, barcodes, you got scanner guns, you got product all over the shelves, and you got price tags from top dollar to way down cheap stuff, right? But there's the store of humanity, and you got the same exact price tag on everyone. So it's not spiritual hype to say everybody's worth the same. No, 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 the blood of Jesus proves it. The same price tags on every head. What's that mean? That every head possesses the same value to him. That's amazing. Wonder if we'd just get that and believe that and believe that every mountain is brought down and every valley's up and there is no hot shot in low life. Wonder if we'd actually just believe it's everybody in need of his mercy and he's amazing. And all of a sudden we're just humbled and we're like, wow. It's a level plane of righteousness. We all need grace. We all need paid for. And we all have the same value. How can you say we all have the same value? We do. I didn't say same gifts. I said same value. Here's what makes us all have the same value. Everyone in this room and everyone on this earth could wake up this morning and wake up tomorrow morning the rest of their days to pursue his image and to walk in love. You might not have the same gifts as this one. You might have completely different gifts than this one. But we can all wake up for the same reason. We can all wake up to shine. We can all wake up to be like him. Yeah? Now what do you think the earth would be like if every Christian would grab a hold of this and say, you know what? Christ in me, the hope of glory. I'm not going after things. I'm going after him. I'm not going to let life determine my joy. The good news already settled that. Christ has come and lives in me. 
And all of a sudden, you go to work with that perspective. You live in your family with that perspective. You go to the store in that perspective. And all of a sudden, you're not disgruntled, and people don't bother you, and you're not frustrated because they cut you off and jumped in line, and they're taking too long and hit a wrong key, and now they got to call the manager, and am I ever going to get home? And all of a sudden, you're not selling cheap a hundred different ways because you realize you're not for sale. You've already been bought with a price, and you're not your... Oh. So you miss a connection when you're flying, and it's not like some judgment from God because you did something and didn't confess it. <laughs> it's not the end of the world. You miss your connection, you missed your connection. Oh, well. So now you're around a whole new sphere of influence. You wouldn't have been around if you were on that plane. Might as well make the most of it. You're going to be sitting beside somebody you'd have never been sitting beside. You ought to say, Amen. Yeah? That sure beats being frustrated and bothered, and I hate traveling, and traveling really wears you out. And people look at me and say, well, you understand. You travel all the time. And I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> I have fun, man. I just have fun. Let me try to get this done. I got to back up and get this done. We got to read this. I tried. The Lord knows I tried. <laughs> Since we've heard of your faith, verse 4. I'm only on verse 4. This is scary. I'm trying to get to 21. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Valerie, for your encouraging faith. <laughs> Since we heard of your faith, Miss Val, in Christ Jesus, and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which has come to you, as it also has in all the world. Let's make sure it's come in all the world. And is bringing forth fruit. In this the Father's well pleased that you bear much, and your fruit. Amen. Amen. Wonder if that means just believing what you believe and that thing will be your life. Consistency. Yeah? The Lord asked me a long time ago. He said, Dan, do you know why you live the way you do? And I knew what he meant when he asked me because he asked me. You might not have known if he asked you, but he meant consistency. Just every day the same. Not trying to be okay. I have not one memory in 23 years of trying to be okay. Not one. I just wake up and I know who I am in him and who he is in me. And it's just steady. Every day, it's just been the simplest, most consistent, amazing thing. And every day, I just wake up. I've never tried to be a Christian. I never one time thought about trying not to sin. I've just woke up. I'm his. Yay. So he said, do you know why you live the way you do? And I answered like you would have. I said, because you're amazing. Your grace is sufficient to me. You're so good, God. And I started to give him glory. And I was sure I heard the Lord chuckle in my heart. And he said, well, that's not the answer I'm looking for. And I said, Lord, that's the only answer. Because we know we are what we are by the grace of God. Listen, nobody has a thing unless God has given it. There's no boasting in men. All we're going to go down in history as is people that believed what he said and what he did. That's what we're, oh, if I can be known as a believer, then everything else is going to fit. Yeah. He said, do you know why you live the way you do? And I said, because you're amazing, your grace is sufficient, et cetera, et cetera. I heard the Lord chuckle in my heart and he said, that's not the answer I was looking for. I said, Lord, I'm confused. That's the only answer. I am what I am by the grace of God. There is, that is the only answer. He said, nope. He said, everything you praise me for needs a place to land in your life. See, it's one thing to say God is all merciful. It's another thing for you to position yourself to receive mercy. It's one thing to say God loves you. It's another thing for you to position yourself and be loved. It's another thing to say God forgives, but are you walking forgiven? He said, do you know why you live the way you do? I said, because you're amazing. He said, that's not the answer I was looking for. I said, it's the only answer. He said, Dan, what you said needs a place to land. Let me tell you why you live the way you do every day. And I was confused. Not in a bad way. I was just like, and he said, on the night you got saved, you were sin conscious for a moment in time and saw your desperate need for me. 
But ever since that moment, you've been a son in your heart. And that's all you've known. And it's why you live the way you do every day. Because you know your mind. And I just sat there and cried and cried. I already had been through a whole box of Kleenexes. And I was in a service. And I was supposed to preach. So the timing was terrible in my opinion. <laughs> it was terrible. But he did it anyway. I'm not kidding you. I went through a whole box of Kleenexes. Because I was trying to get up to get ready to preach. Because you can tell you do church enough. And you know we're at that place. I'm going to be getting up there. And he wouldn't let me get up. And I'd go to get up. And he'd just breathe on me and melt me. And he'd say, I love you. I remember him saying, I'm so proud of you. You, you have somebody prophesy that the Lord's proud. It'll bring a tear to your eye. You let the Lord hover over you and breathe on you and say, I'm so proud of you. You don't even, you think you're going to die. It's too much. It's like, stop. You know, it's like, what do you do? Well, that's why people get, that's why they, they, what do you do? He said, the reason you live the way you do is you were sin conscious for a moment in time and saw your need for me. But ever since that moment, you've been a son in your heart. Not a son in my confession, a son in my heart. What's that mean? That means I approach him as he's my father. I approach him as I'm his. I approach him unveiled with boldness, not arrogance, boldness because he loves me. And when I was yet a sinner, he sent his son. How much more now will he save me from wrath since Jesus lives? I see a high priest. He's passed through the heavens. He's Jesus, the son of God, come boldly into his throne room and receive mercy and grace in every time of need. Yeah? Make sure today you settle something in your heart and don't make it this process thing Todd talked about. I hear that word all the time. Well, brother, some people get things right away. Some people process. I see what we're psychologically trying to say, but why would you buy time? Throw that away. And just say, you know what? I see this thing. You love me. Why would you process in receiving his love? You love me, period. And then you start praying that way, communing that way, believing that way, receiving that way. Amen? Amen. I'll, I'll finish on going out there. I was going to do that first, but I'll just do this here quick. I got a little bit of time. So he's heard, he's heard of their faith. He's heard of their love for everybody. And, and this gospel's been preached in all the world. As it has been among you and since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. And you also learned it from, from, from Epaphras and our dear fellow servant. He's a faithful minister of the gospel on your behalf. Who also declared to us your love in the spirit. So this guy said, man, these guys got love down pat. These guys, he was telling Paul, these guys understand. So for this reason, whew, see... The whole goal is to become love. So when Paul heard that these guys were walking in love for that reason, he didn't stop praying. <laughs> for this reason, since the day we heard this, we don't cease to pray for you. Do you get it? What Paul is saying is, yes, these guys are becoming what he paid for. We aren't going to stop praying. We're going to pray that they continue in this revelation and keep manifesting the finished work of why Jesus came. They're not praying because they don't have love. They're praying and don't cease praying because they are walking in love. They're going, this is the finished work. This is what he paid for. This is the glory of his inheritance. This is what he gets out of men by paying for his son, many sons. We aren't going to stop praying that this thing continues to flourish and grow. Here's the raw truth. Today is what? Thursday. We got Friday, Saturday, Sunday. On Sunday, churches all over the country are going to have services in the morning. True? Agreed? Simple thought, right? Let's just get extreme. Fill every church... And every seat in every church across this country on Sunday, it's not going to change a thing probably. But you take every person in every seat and they all become love. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. It is wow. Guys, you can go to church for the rest of your life and do church and forget and fail to become her. I just know this is right. Attending church is amazing. Don't stop, but make sure you know why you're going. 
You're not going to qualify. You already are. You're not going to be accepted. You already are. You're going to maintain a focus, stay sharp and stirred up in love and good works and celebrate a truth that we all live under. That's why you gather yourselves together. And you don't cease doing it even more till you see that day, as you see that day approaching. Why? Because little foxes that steal the fruit of the vine, and all of a sudden I'm only as good as them going, as things are going, and all of a sudden life's speaking louder than truth, and all of a sudden I'm not doing okay because of this, that, and the other. Come on, gather yourselves together, stay focused, stay sharp, and stir one another. Come on, stir one another in love and good works. Yeah? So wonder, see, you could fill every church across this country, and it doesn't mean it'll change a thing. But if every person that goes to church becomes love, Bible love, and loves not their own life unto death, and doesn't take account of suffered wrongs, and seeks not their own, I wonder if this one room I'm looking at, just says, you know what, I'm putting my foot down today and I'm going after this love thing and I'm done making excuses and I'm done talking around it and I'm not going to be analytical. I'm not going to say, yeah, but brother, you don't understand what I've really been going through. Well, how would you feel if and all of a sudden you're painting some picture outside of Christ? You try to tell Jesus that who got mistreated nonstop, who did amazingly good, like Jesus was flawlessly good, and got treated as if he was totally wrong? Maybe you need to talk to Jesus about that. At the night he was betrayed. He's holding the bread and the cup. He looks around at their own, his own guys. Who he poured into all these years. Come on. This is the recipe for a hurting minister. You lay down your life and you pour all your secrets. You take three alone and give them the intimate things. And you got nine others that you run together with. There's 12 in all. And you're intimate. You pour out your life and you hold nothing back. And on the night you're betrayed, you don't feel betrayed. Whew. On the night you're betrayed... You look right at the men that you see are ready to run and disown you and, and renounce that they even know you. Come on. They're all sitting there. We'll die for him. He knows not one of them will. He knows all the scriptures are written. He's going to be struck. They're going to be scattered. You say, yeah, but Jesus knew. He knew they were going to. He saw all things. He knew. And you could try to talk around it all you want. But that same Jesus told me to follow him, that what was in him could be in me, and that on the night I'm betrayed, I don't have to cry and call a friend for prayer. I can pass the bread and pass the cup because I've already laid down my life. That sounds a little more healthy than hurting. <laughs> or you can get analytical. See, I'm back at the beginning now of the service. Say, yeah, but brother, I laid down my life for these people. These are the people I thought I could trust. And if I can't trust them, who can I trust? And all this seems like it was built for nothing. And all this waste of time. People are just people. I don't know if we can ever get this ship rolling because nobody's going to stick together and lay down the kingdom. I'm just hurt. I'm frustrated. Well, I don't know what to do. Oh, that sounds exciting. <laughs> Profitable. <laughs> the last thing you and I need is a justification to not be like him. That's sure deception. On the night he was, his idea of responding was lay down his life. When he raised from the dead, he didn't have a beef with them. He called them brethren. I love it. Oh, I love Jesus so much. He walks in a room where they're huddled for fear, still afraid they're going to die. And he's raised from the dead. <laughs> He walks in the room full of compassion. Forgive them, Father. They don't understand. And he says, peace to you. He said to Mary, go tell my brethren. I'm going to my father and your father. He's making them one. Ain't that something? Guys, this following Jesus isn't just seeing somebody healed. Let's not make following Jesus all about the power of God. It's about the heart of God way before it's about the power of God. Because the power of God is only going to be stewarded and handled properly through the heart of God. 
your kingdom come, your will be done on. We always use that for the power of God. No cancer in heaven, it gives us faith to pray. No cancer on the earth. Whatever we bind, shall we bound. Whatever we lose, shall we And we always preach the power of God. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. No sickness in heaven, no sickness on the earth. And it's not wrong. It's a faith builder. It's scripturally correct. But isn't it amazing? Our examples are always the power of God and sickness. Well, there's no animosity in heaven. There's no backbiting. There's no willfulness. There's no hurt and offense. There's no selfishness whatsoever. Your will be done on as it is in. Your kingdom, your will be. Yeah? Yeah. So good. I didn't do well. No, I didn't. <laughs> I mean, I might have, but, but not in regards to what I'm talking about. I did terrible. <laughs> and I'm okay about it. <sighs> oh, Lord. Todd read this prayer this morning. Verse 10, he read verse 9. For this reason, today we heard of it, we pray. And that's that you be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Why? That you may walk worthy of the Lord, that your life reveals him. Fully pleasing unto him. You please him by faith, guys. Believing, never letting anything change your mind. Being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might. Do you hear the revelation Paul has of the Christian life? It's phenomenal. According to his glorious power with all patience and long suffering with joy. Not prayer requests. <laughs> giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. He's qualified us. Past tense. To be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Oh my goodness, I guess you don't have a past. He has, he has delivered you and me, us, from the power of darkness. He's conveyed us. It's a whole other teaching. I don't have time, but if you live by feelings, sensuality, impressions, memory, you're going to think you're still in darkness and in bondage, and sometimes it's lies just tormenting what you don't understand. My Bible says you have been delivered. I promise you this. I'm looking stern and talking strong. I can't see your eyeballs, but I'm trying to see as many as I can. The day you stand in your bedroom and lift your hands high when nobody's in the room, no matter how you feel, and start saying, Father, you have delivered me from the power of darkness. You have translated me into the kingdom of the son of your love, and I am yours, and you are mine. And you believe that through the cross. I promise you things begin to change in the way you feel and impressions and memories and things like that. What Todd was talking about this morning, I totally agree with. We've spent countless hours ministering to flashbacks, impressions, memories, and dreams. And we think because we're having them, it's still us instead of we're recollecting what was. So the thing keeps us trapped in that place instead of us saying, wow, God, thank you, I'm changed. So you wake up and have a demonic remembering dream. Why do you need prayer? You just need truth. Sit up in your bed and say, man, Father, I thank you. That's not true about me anymore. Wow, that would have been my life five years ago. And I wouldn't have had a chance. But you saved me, changed me, delivered me. Let the dream throw you into intimacy and a proclamation of the finished work. You don't need prayer. You have answers. You have truth. Rather than, do, 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 man, can you pray for me? I just had the craziest demonic dream. I don't want these dreams anymore. I'm so afraid to go to sleep. I hate the nighttime. Pray if God doesn't change something. I don't know what I'm going to do. See, I've gotten those phone calls. You can tell. <laughs> something about seeing different. Not taking it personal. See, if it's not about you, you won't internalize the dream. Because you've already taken this person. Oh, you've eternalized the truth. And now that dream has no place to touch you except truth. And in its attempt to break you, it's actually making you. Because it gets you to respond in what you know. Not what you experienced. And it's a big difference. It's called living by the Spirit. Are you with me? 
Okay, I'm four minutes late and Tom didn't come up and get me out of here yet, so I'm going to read something real, real quick. I'm going to force Tom to bump me out here. No, he's right there. We're, we're closing. We're closing. He has delivered us from the power of darkness, conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love, in whom we have redemption. That means brought back, brought back to original value, a restoration to truth through his blood. Wow. The forgiveness of sins. So the sins are what? Forgiven. Whew. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Isn't that amazing that he just speaks like that about Jesus, and Jesus is like willing to give his life to make us one with him. Do you get it? He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me, now go in my name. He's been given the name above every name, and at the mention of his name, every knee will bow, every tongue confess, earth, under the earth, above the earth, and he is Lord, right? And says, you therefore, he goes from that place of exaltation and goes right to us and says, you therefore, work out your own salvation with a trembling and a fear before the Lord. What's he doing? He's making us one, because we're the body of Christ. That's why you're going to pray for people today and expect that God would move through your heart, through your life. You're not going to pray to feel better about yourself. You're going to pray because he shed his blood. He died on the cross for everyone that they might be saved, that they might know him, right? Mercy triumphs over judgment. No matter what they believe or where they're living, they are a candidate for the mercy of God because mercy triumphs over judgment. And I've learned this scripturally. There is one thing about God the devil cannot and will never defeat. What the devil can't defeat about God is his mercy. Men don't get what they deserve. Wonder if you become merciful. All of a sudden men don't get what they deserve. They get what he paid for. Yeah. Well how long brother? I mean when do you just. Well how much am I supposed to take? Well I don't know if I can. Boy, if God took that language, he'd have never sent his son. He'd have gave up on you and me a long time ago, friend. And if you can't take what you're thinking, believing, and feeling and put it in the mouth of God and make it work, probably ought to come out of yours. Yeah? Because if he ain't saying it, then I don't want it in mine. Okay. Now watch this real quick. Guys, this is my last scripture. I'm skipping to 21. And you, you, here you go. You and you. See, you. He just exalted Jesus. Bam, 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 bam. And you, who were once alienated and enemies, why were you enemies? In your mind. Your mind was working contrary to truth, to love, and to the kingdom. Your mind was working in Adam. Self-centered, way that seems right to a man. You were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. That doesn't just mean adultery, murder, rape, robbery. It means thinking for yourself when you're created for his image. Thinking contrary to purpose and truth. Yeah? If you love the world and the things in the world, the love of the Father's not in you. And the things of the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Come on, these things are motivations. Not evil doings, motivations. Are you with me? Whew. Oh my goodness, look at this. You're alienated enemies by the way your mind's working in wicked manner. Yet now he has reconciled. He's made you friends with him. How'd he do it? In the body of his flesh through death. Why? To present you. Holy, ah, blameless, ah, and above reproach in his sight. But watch, almost seems like a catch, but it's not a catch. It's where faith comes in. If indeed you continue in the faith. In other words, if you keep believing that's your position now that he came and you don't let anything change your mind, you believe in his sight. Holy, blameless, above reproach. Watch, guys. That's how you make the tree good without getting into works. 
holy, blameless, above reproach. A minute ago, I was evil and wicked. The way my mind worked was contrary to the kingdom. He came. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Boom, born again. Yay, new and living way inside of me. Thinking through new eyes, new mind, new heart, a new reason for being. Yeah? And all of a sudden, I'm holy in a moment. Holy, blameless, and above reproach. Hey, Dan, you know why you live the way you do? Why, Lord? Because every day you see yourself as a son. Oh, holy, blameless. It's in your Bible. It's not my notes. Holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. If indeed, if indeed you continue steadfast, grounded, and rooted, and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard. Watch this. Many people went to church their whole life and never heard this hope. They've heard, well, you know, you're always going to sin, and, you know, try hard, and make sure you do some good works here, and please come to church, and you better tithe, and make sure you're there, man. When Jesus comes back, you want to be in church, dude. Do you know how many people lived their whole life and never heard the hope of this gospel? Never woke up and even considered that they were holy in the sight of God. The Bible says righteousness produces its fruit to holiness. When you see how he sees you, the way he created you to live becomes evident and obvious and simple. All of a sudden you're living holy without biting your lip to be holy. Why? Because you see what you've become through him. Now here's the joy of this and this is where it fits with power and love. What God wants is for you to so see that about your life that when you walk out of these doors, it has to be the same truth for everyone. Whether they see it or not, it's their truth to grow in, to be touched by, and to be loved by. If he did this for you, did he do it for everybody out there? Is it once for all? Is it all who come, all who say, and call on the name of the Lord, right? So here's the joy of what we're preaching. It's not some self-absorbed, just all about me and my identity. When I see me this way, I realize he sees you this way. And it doesn't change the, just the view of my own life. It changes my view of your life. And no matter how you're conducting yourself or how you're living, it gives me the capacity to love you. Because forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. That's the power of the gospel. And that's what changes us. Are you with me? So when you're out there today, don't be long-winded with folks like I'm long-winded in my session. <laughs> Don't pray forever with people. Some people are already uncomfortable. Not everybody, but some people. Just be sensitive to people. You want to be a blessing. You want to be a blessing. Your goal is to give them a real encounter with God and to validly love them in the spirit of the Lord, okay? I understand leading to the Lord. I understand salvation. I understand explaining relationship with Jesus, getting them saved and water baptized and pouring that jug. That's, that is awesome. That's full circle awesome. But just be simple when you go out there and know this. My number one goal is to give people the sincere encounter with God through his love. Just a sincere. I'm going to be a seed sower and the kingdom of God is if a man scatters seed. I'm sowing seed. Watch. If we don't sow, nothing's going to grow. But if we sow, God will bring an increase. Are you with me? Stand to your feet. We're going to pray as, as a house, as a, as a body. Thanks, guys. No, thank you for being here and being excited about being here. Guys, this thing's not a fairy tale. It's not unreachable. It's actually very simple. It's full of grace and it's real. I can't emphasize enough as Todd was this morning. It's all about believing. The blood's enough. I'm a new creation. You live in me. If you're struggling with your emotions, you get along with God. Father, I tend to react to the ways I used to be and the way growing up and the way I used to respond to so and so. But man, none of that is the truth about me. Thank you for causing my heart to be changed, my motive to be changed. See, here's what we don't understand. As our heart gets formed in love by yielding and saying yes, our re response life changes, the way we hear things changes, the way we see changes. When you become love, everything changes. So Father, I'm asking for this grace and revelation of the love of God to come on our lives right now in a very special way. Not just tangible, not just ooh, ah, I feel your love, God, but see your love and see 
how valuable you see us, that, that our lives are worth redemption to you. Our lives are worth the blood of your son. That Jesus, you were willing to come in a man's body to restore man to what he was intended to be. That is amazing. It's not a mystery. It is revealed. And we say yes and we say thank you. So I want you to say this with me. And I know it might sound like a little bit of a, a parrot thing or a puppet thing in a sense. But don't let it be that. Don't get tricked into that. Say it from your heart. And it won't be anything that I'm saying that, that you'll have trouble saying in the sense of just repeating. But when you say it, I want you to think about it. And I want you to believe it. Okay? So I want you to say this with me and listen to me and then think about it and then repeat it and wrap faith around this. Father, I thank you that you love me. You've loved me from the beginning. You have never changed your mind about me. Not one time. You've always seen me for what you created me to be. And Jesus' blood has always spoke better things. On my darkest day, you still knew exactly who I was. Your love has never lost sight of me. Today I say thank you. I receive your love. I'm forgiven. I'm not ashamed. I have new life. Not a past. It's not about what happened to me back then. It's about what you're doing in me now. I accept new life. And with that new life, I accept new eyes. That I see what you see. That when I see through these eyes, I'll see what you behold. I believe we're one. You live in me. You'll shine through me. And you'll love through me. And it'll be easy because of the grace that's on my life. You're the God of all grace. And I receive it and say thank you for the good news. So when I go out today, I thank you. I'll see the value of people. You're making all things new. In your name, Jesus, we thank you. And receive all these things. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you guys. Bless you.